Hello, my name is Alessandro Ferretti. I'm the CEO of TRE, and the topic of my presentation today is satellite INSAR data and their application to the oil and gas sector. The outline of my presentation is the following. I will start spending a few words about satellite radar sensors, and I will try to explain how it's possible to measure surface deformation phenomena from space with an accuracy of just a few millimeters. Oil and gas applications are related to subsidence estimation, reservoir monitoring, and then I will also cover with a few words two very important topics, carbon capture and storage and underground gas storage. Finally, I will try to draw some conclusions about future trends and why we should care about INSAR data. But let's start with the main actor of our story, the satellite radar sensor. A synthetic aperture radar works by illuminating the Earth with a beam of coherent microwave radiation, such as a laser. The most important frequency bands used by SAR data are X-band, C-band, L-band. Typically, the wavelength is just a few centimeters long. Why radar data are so important? Well, here you have an example. This is an area in the Far East. It's almost impossible to find a very good optical image due to cloud coverage. On the left-hand side, here you see the radar acquisition. Actually, this radar acquisition was acquired in, at night time. And <laughs> these are the most important points. So indeed, SAR data can be acquired independently of sun illumination. It, it is an all-weather sensor. It penetrates clouds, rain, dry sand, and partially vegetation. And uh, it's a coherent sensor. Typically, the image is created, is generated by scanning the Earth, and uh, these sensors typically have uh, a right-looking acquisition geometry. So you have range and azimuth as the so-called SAR coordinates. But what's a SAR image? A SAR image is a set of pixels characterized by both amplitude and phase information. Here we have an example. So amplitude data are uh, dependent on the amount of uh, electromagnetic energy backscattered towards the radar sensor, while phase information is related to the sensor to target distance. So the phase of a single SAR image, since it is known modulo 2 pi, is of no practical use. But the secret of SAR interferometry is to try to compare two SAR images acquired from the very same acquisition geometry, try to highlight possible phase variation. So we have like a ruler in which the unit of length is the wavelength of the SAR sensor. And since we are dealing in the microwave domain with the centimetric wavelength, we are extremely sensitive to any displacement of the radar target on ground. So what's the basic idea? The basic idea is the following. We have a first acquisition over a certain area of interest. We can have a certain phenomenon uh, creating a displacement. Then we acquire a second radar acquisition. And then we detect and compare different range measurements at different times. Is that easy? Well, sometimes it is indeed easy. This is an example. It's a true real life SAR interferogram. This is a co-seismic interferogram. This is the dislocation, the displacement field generated by an earthquake in Iran. In this case, it was enough to create an interferogram with the two SAR images, one acquired before the earthquake, one, the second one acquired after the earthquake. Each of those fringes correspond to displacement of just 28 millimeters. But sometimes it's not that easy. That's why in the late 90s, different techniques have been developed to deal with reflectivity changes, because of course you cannot measure a fraction of a wavelength uh, on a tree, for example, or very vegetated areas, and uh, to deal with uh, different atmospheric disturbances in the troposphere and also in the ionosphere. So what's the recipe? Well, the recipe is not to use just two images, but a long temporal series of SAR data 
you identify coherent reader targets and only on coherent reader targets you try to remove, get rid of atmospheric effects and estimate the real time series of deformation affecting a certain reader target. This is an optical image of Long Beach, California. And now we superimpose the family of uh, coherent scattering centers that uh, we can use to extrapolate and, uh, and estimate displacement phenomena. The color bars is between minus 10 and plus 10 millimeters per year. Red means a movement away from the reader sensor and blue a movement towards the reader sensor. Since the incidence angle in this case is just uh, 23 degrees, we are very sensitive to any vertical displacement. And of course we can find the footprint of the subsidence of the uh, Wilmington oil field in Long Beach and the Torrance oil field. And in general, we don't have just the average displacement rate, so the velocity field, but uh, for each of those points, we can actually extract a time series of displacement. Fantastic. From 800 kilometers in space, we are measuring a displacement of a few millimeters. So, but what are we actually measuring? Just one component of the 3D displacement vector affecting a certain radar target. So remember, in INSAR, at least whenever you are using just one acquisition geometry, you are using just one component of the 3D displacement vector, the projection of the 3D vector on along the line of sight of the satellite. And this is, of course, our color bar. Red, again, a movement away from the sensor and blue towards the sensor. Actually, by combining the rotation of the Earth and the orbital path of the satellites, it's possible to illuminate any area on Earth using two different satellite geometries. And so it's possible to actually combine the data and then extract vertical and east-west displacements. Unfortunately, due to the acquisition geometry and the fact that the orbit are almost polar orbit, we are not sensitive to north-south displacements. What about the precision? Well, common to differential GPS and other geodetic techniques, all INSAR measurements are differential measurements with respect to a reference reader target. And data precision depends on many factors, but the most important one are the number of images, the density of measurement points we could identify over the area of interest, the climatic conditions at the time of the acquisition, and of course, the distance from the reference point. Typically, you get a precision better than one millimeter per year in average displacement rate estimation and over each single measurement better than three millimeter, at least using the new X-band data. But it's time now to speak about the applications and we will focus just on oil and gas application. First question. What's the rationale of using surface deformation data in oil and gas applications? Well, uh, we are used to using seismic data to create uh, an image of the Earth interior and to possibly identify uh, reservoirs. Then we typically drill observation wells to improve the level of information we have about the reservoir and eventually we can come up with a model a model of the reservoir and, in general, a geomechanical model also of the overburden. Now, when we start the exploitation of a reservoir, typically we change the stress field in the reservoir. We change the pressure of the reservoir and typically we change the effective stress. This can create volumetric strains that can eventually create a surface displacement, can have a surface expression. So, what's the basic idea? We want to be able to invert, using surface deformation data, for possible compaction of the reservoir, but also possible dislocation of faults. So we can have a tensile fracture, a shear motion of the fault, and all these uh, phenomena can have 
a surface expression. So the recipe is to use both ascending and descending data, so to be able to have access to both vertical and horizontal displacement data, and then we try to invert for the geophysical parameters we are looking for, typically the pressure field and possibly the dislocation of uh, faults. But it's now time to speak about uh, real-life examples. In this picture, you have an optical image of a giant field in the Middle East. And we can overlap the results of uh, the processing of 28 uh, Redosat-1 images, so 28 SAR acquisitions uh, over three years. We could identify more than 200,000 permanent scatterers, so 200,000 measurement points over an, an area of about uh, 120 square kilometers. Apart from the average displacement rate, so the average velocity of the terrain, we can actually get much more than that because uh, we have uh, a time-lapse analysis. So we can really see and follow the deformation of the terrain during the exploitation of the reservoir. The shape of the deformation, of course, is related to what's happening at the reservoir level. Apart from the shape of the subsidence ball, so red means typically subsidence, you see here that there is also an abrupt change, a blue bubble coming up due to the injection of fluid in the wrong layer, an uplift of more than 40 centimeters. So it's really the analysis, the careful analysis of this data that can allow us also to characterize or in general extract more information about folds and the joints in the reservoir. Here we have a cross-section of the vertical displacement field as a function of time. And you, you can see that in, whenever you have a discontinuity, typically there is a good agreement with the location of folds identified in the seismic cube. But we can do much more than that. We can run also wide area mapping here we are in Kuwait, and it was possible to run this analysis over thousands of square kilometers. And if we now compare the velocity field estimated by radar data with the location of the most important giants in Kuwait, we see a striking correlation between the location of Burgan, Unkudeir, Minagishi, and Wafra. Wherever there is exploitation, typically you have subsidence, depending, of course, on the level of uh, subsidence, you can have or invert different geophysical parameters. Here we have another example of what you can extract when you run a water flooding project. Once again, we are in uh, Kuwait, uh, and this is the average displacement rate in millimeters per year. We could identify 200,000 measurement points in this area, and uh, you see blue uplift, red, subsidence created by the exploitation of the reservoir. So it's fantastic because for each of those points, we can extract a time series and uh, really correlate, uh, correlate the time series with uh, what we know about uh, the injection and the production activities. So we can, for example, then look into a specific cross-section and here you have an example of analysis where you can identify also discontinuities typically related to faults governing the reservoir. Okay, so it's a time-lapse analysis that can tell you a lot about what's going on. Typically, where fluids are going to and where the extracted fluid are coming from. But there are two more examples I'd like to mention because are becoming more and more common for the exploitation of INSAR data. The first example is related to carbon capture and storage. You know that the basic idea is not to vent CO2 in the atmosphere, but try to store CO2 in uh, geological formations. Here we had the possibility to run an INSAR analysis over INSALA a very important CCS project run by BP, Sonatrack and Statoil. 
where more than 3 million tons of CO2 have been injected from 2004 to 2010. There were three inject injection wells, and here is the displacement data we could uh, generate using a data stack of radar images. What is very important here is, of course, there is a correlation between the location of our blue bubbles, uh, meaning that, of course, we had an uplift of the terrain uh, wherever there was an injector, but the shape of the bubbles is really the most important source of information. Over KB502, for example, it was possible to observe a double lobe pattern, much different compared to what you see at KB501, for example. Of course, uh, this pattern, pattern is characteristic of the opening of a tensile fracture, and this was an invaluable source of information for the operators. The SAR database, database about the displacement of the terrain over in Sala, was used to invert surface deformation data for the estimation of the aperture of this tensile fracture. And uh, the details have been published in several scientific papers. Apart from CCS, UGS is another very intriguing application of SAR data. For underground gas storage, typically we store gas in summer and then we pump gas for heating in winter. Now, by correlating the injected and extracted gas volume with the vertical displacement of the terrain, it's possible to calibrate geomechanical models and then we can fix in a much more reliable way the maximum pressure of the UGS. But what about data? Data sources we can exploit now for oil and gas projects. Well, this is the general scenario we are facing right now. We have C-band, L-band and X-band data. For historical analysis, typically we have uh, data starting from 1992 for most of the areas on our planet. And uh, now we have three families of uh, radar sensors still active. We have RadarSat2, C-band, and TerraSAR-X and Cosmos SkyMed for X-band data. They don't have the very same repeat cycle, so depending on the sensor, you have a different temporal frequency of acquisition over the area of interest. For TerraSAR-X, you have 11 days, for example. For Cosmos SkyMed, you have four independent satellites. It's a constellation, and so the effective repeat cycle is just four days. And for Radarsat 2, we have a 24-day repeat cycle. Fortunately enough, 2014 is a very important year for SAR because uh, two very important sensors have been uh, launched in the last few weeks. Uh, and we have ALOS 2 and Sentinel-1 now uh, ready for us to process the data. So what's the general trend in uh, satellite radar data? Well, the trend is for higher and higher spatial resolution. And so we will have more and more measurement points we, could, uh, we can identify over a certain area of interest. And apart from the better spatial resolution of the data, we have a much better temporal resolution. So we can really follow nonlinear uh, deformation signals. But it's now time to draw some conclusions. Well, Inside data can map the temporal evolution of ground displacements over wide areas, even thousands of square kilometers, in a fraction of time needed for in situ observations. They provide users with the ability to quantify historical ground movement because there are historical databases and allow oil and gas companies to regularly monitor production areas for environmental monitoring and risk mitigation. For example, to detect the reactivation of false threatening well uh, integrity. And they allow geologists and geophysicists to develop better reservoir models by calibrating model parameters using surface deformation data. I really think Insta data is a very valuable source of information. And thank you for your attention.